Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Thanks, to, thanks for being here. We have a lot of people with us online and a few people in the room. And I just want to remind the people online, if you ever want to join us in the room, we actually have really good snacks right now. So the people in the room can tell you more about it. Um, and also the reminder for those of you online, if you have questions or comments for the speaker at any time during the presentation, um, go ahead and put them in the chat box and I will read them out at the end of the presentation. And also just a disclaimer from the Grand Rounds Planning Committee, the Grand Rounds Planning Committee has has no financial relationships to disclose. So from here, I will turn things over to Dr. Opal, who will introduce our speaker and our lectureship for today. For those that don't know me, I'm Doug Opal. I'm director of the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics and Palliative Care. And welcome to the 17th annual Truman Katz uh, lectureship. Before introducing our speaker, I want to take a few minutes to acknowledge uh, Truman Katz, uh, for whom this lecture is named. But before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional unceded land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people, past and present. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as one way to honor the land we are on. So a bit about Truman Katz. Um, he was president and CEO uh, here at Children's for 26 years, from 1979 to 2005, and he was really recognized for his visionary uh, leadership, um, guiding children uh, to financial stability, um, securing broad-based community support for the hospital and its mission, and building new and in innovative programs to meet the diverse health needs of children, like building regional clinics so children could get the care they needed closer to home. Um, a few of his many accomplishments included developing a model medical school affiliation with the University of Washington School of Medicine, which continues to serve as a uh, model academic private partnership. Uh, he was involved in the creation of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and prompted development of the first rate research program we all experience today. Dur during his tenure at Children's, he developed a long standing interest in quality of care and respecting the role. Uh, of families, and out of that, uh, his interest in ethics, is, and his interest in ethics extended to research and his emerging appreciation of the role of clinical research in advancing uh, pediatric health care. Um, in honor of uh, Truman and his interest in ethics, the uh, Seattle Children's Board of Trustees established the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics now over 15 years ago now is the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics and Palliative Care. And as part of uh, uh, starting the center, uh, also began this annual Truman Katz lectureship. So thank you to the Board of Trustees, and thank you in particular to Truman Katz. So let me now introduce our speaker for today's annual lectureship. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to um, have Professor Alta Charo with us today, speaking uh, with us. Uh, Professor Charo is the Warren P. Knowles Professor Emerita of Law and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin, where she taught biotechnology, regulatory policy, public health law, and medical ethics for over 30 years. She's worked um, in government as a legal and policy analyst for the U.S. Congress's former Office of Technology Assessment, for the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the US FDA. In addition, she served as a member of the NIH Human Embryo Research Panel and on President Clinton's National Bioethics Advisory Commission. Professor Charo has been elected to a number of national academies, including the US National Academy of Medicine, where she co-chaired its seminal reports on embryonic stem cell research and on human genome editing. She's also been elected to the American Association of Advancement of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Chow now works as an independent bioethics consultant, advising government, professional organizations, and companies on many ethical and regulatory issues, particularly those relating to clinical trials of emerging therapies and regarding reproductive technologies. So please join me in welcoming Professor Chow. Thank you, Doug, and thank you for the very kind introduction. And thank you for those of you here who came in person. Welcome to those that are on the screen. I'm going to be talking today, as you can see, about a new area or really uh, emerging area of genome editing, much of the discussion and debate in the United States. 
has been about so-called heritable germline editing, which is currently not legally possible in the US and is formally forbidden in many other countries. Um, somatic editing of uh, children and adults is proceeding apace. We can certainly talk about that in the Q&A if you like, because we now have uh, the uh, first successes in the areas of things like sickle cell disease and a great deal of progress on a variety of retinopathies and some areas of cancer under research and HIV as well. Um, but left undiscussed in most of the conferences I attend is this intermediate potential area of application, which is in a utero. Um, whoops, I realized I should not do that. I should do this to change the slide. There we go. Um, before I begin, I should at least acknowledge the conflict and biases. Most of these are biases. These are the kinds of panels I've served on. Doug mentioned them. At the bottom, though, you'll see uh, a list of companies that I work with. None of them are working on in utero editing, and I don't expect to speak about any unapproved products and their uses. Um, but because I am working with Planned Parenthood on issues related to fetal tissue, there is a remote relationship to what I'll be talking about here, which is fetal therapy, but still not the same thing. Just to let you know, though, in case it's a problem for anybody. So <clears throat> fetal therapy is certainly not a brand new concept. I mean, people here have been working on it for decades, and we see this progress from open fetal surgery all the way to things like blood transfusions. And so today, we're arriving at this interesting area of stem cell transplant and enzyme replacement therapy, which is now in a clinical trial, which I'll mention in a moment, and then gene therapy. Um, the ongoing experience with molecular fetal therapies actually um, goes back quite a ways to 1989, where we're talking about um, the lymphocyte syndrome. And I want to acknowledge here Tippi McKenzie at UCSF, with whom I've been working now for about two years in the area of developing ethical standards for in utero editing. She is the physician scientist who is one of the leaders in this emerging field of, of therapeutic intervention. And I've borrowed about three of her slides. Uh, for this presentation. Um, so what we've been seeing is the ongoing preclinical work and, and uh, uh, phase one trials working toward a gene therapy possibility. And the most recent one, and this is Tippy's work, is on enzyme replacement therapy for lysosomal storage diseases, something that uh, was uh, put into a phase one trial. And I'd like to talk uh, in about 10 minutes or so about some of the challenges of the FDA concepts about phase one versus phase two and three trials in this area. Um, but with regard to that uh, enzyme replacement, we've got this example from Tippi's work on in utero replacement therapy for Pompe disease. And um, one of the things that is worth at least noting is that there was a very careful stepwise path toward going into these trials. Uh, you take a disease that is understood, although not easily treated, you work with materials that have already been approved for use in already born children and see whether or not there's some way that their use even earlier in gestational development might give you an advantage in treatment of the disease. Um, there were eight different lysosomal storage diseases that they were working with at UCSF uh, with these FDA-approved enzymes. And the rationale was that they understood the family history. This uh, chart here can show you that this particular family already had one child who died at 29 months, a second child who was prenatally diagnosed and then at birth, having had the experience with the first child, uh, the family chose palliative care uh, rather than go through this experience again. And that particular child died at eight months. They now have a third pregnancy that is prenatally diagnosed. And here the question is, is there something we can do prenatally? And the rationale is that rather than trying to wait until after birth, you go prenatally because the uh, cardiomyopathies are so early in the child's development that really by the time the child is born, you're really already way behind trying to save the child. And the second possibility is that there might be some kind of immune benefit because of treating a fetus in utero when the immune system is less developed. You'll notice that the first sibling died at 29 months after having immune reactions to the enzyme. So it raised the question of whether or not there's a different kind of environment uh, just in utero that might make this a more feasible kind of therapy. Um, their third patient, um, as, of the, as of this slide, which I think is now from March, so because she presented it at the International Summit on Genome Editing we had in London, so this is now probably a few months out of date, um, but that patient was showing survival. 
uh, as a result of this therapy. So very promising, but very, very, very early kind of effort here uh, with enzyme replacement therapy. So the question is, really, globally, why would one want to look at doing things in utero? The first is what I was just mentioning, that the fetal immune system really is far more tolerant. And this also becomes very important when we move into the areas of gene therapy that use viral vectors like AAV, because we're already seeing in the efforts with things like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, somatic editing efforts using AAV as a vector um, where the therapy, the therapeutic uh, value is diminishing over time. This was not necessarily expected, but it was diminishing over time, but you couldn't redose because of immune reaction due to the use of the AAV vector. So the inability to do redosing complicates somatic editing postnatally considerably as long as we continue to use the viral vectors. Perhaps doing this in utero means that you've gotten around that problem. And I do think that Duchenne's might become another uh, disease area in which there's interest in seeing whether in utero would be a, a, a better approach. The next is that the fetal stem cells are simply more accessible. Um, you can get to the hematopoietic stem cells more easily in the fetal liver. They haven't yet gone into the bone marrow. Um, and the blood-brain barrier for your neurological disorders is not as well developed as well, so it's easier to access the central nervous system. Um, all of these give some distinct advantages to working in the uterine environment and with fetuses as opposed to waiting for live birth. The last thing on this list I just want to note is literally just the size of the fetus has a couple of implications. One is that you use less of the vector, and so the manufacturing is not as much of a bottleneck. That is still an issue in the biotech field. It has to do with the cost and logistical complications of manufacturing in this area. Using less means you have um, more to go around, literally. Um, you also have lower costs. And since the costs in this area, which I'm going to come back to in my very last slide, are really excessively high, uh, every reduction in cost turns out to be quite significant. Um, and most important uh, is simply that you have the possibility of trying to prevent disease before the tissues and organs are being damaged. Um, that said, um, let's take a look at a specific example in cystic fibrosis. One of the problems that at least, and I, by the way, I should emphasize, because Doug did not, I am not an MD, I'm a JD. So um, everything I say that might be medical, my brother, who is an MD, is cringing. Uh, and, and you are free to correct me as we go forward, please. Um, but my understanding from my colleagues like Ben Wilfond, who used to be at where I was at the other UW, uh, Wisconsin, um, uh, gene, gene therapy difficult because it was so difficult to get the genes into all the necessary cells of the lung and deep in the interstices, very difficult for delivery systems to get there. Whereas in the fetal environment, floating in the amniotic fluid, it's just easier to get to where you need to go. Um, and so we might be able to deal with CF early on before some of the problems accrue, not just the pulmonary problems, but the digestive system problems that can occur early in development and often are not even noted because the child was never genotyped, so nobody realizes the child has CF until they develop some kind of more dramatic symptoms. Uh, so where are we looking at this? Possibly I say we as if I am Tippy. Um, no. Where is Tippy looking at these things, along with some of her colleagues at Wake Forest and other places? Um, here is a short list of some of the kinds of disorders. Uh, there's a lot of interest in spinal muscular atrophy in particular, um, but also for Duchenne's, for Angelman's, for, for cystic fibrosis. And there are multiple systems of approach here. Gene replacement uses AAV or lentivirus, and so it has this problem of uh, creating a risk of an immune reaction and preventing redosing. It has one advantage, however, which is that it's far less likely to pose a risk of altering the germline by accident. Whereas gene editing, as opposed to gene replacement, but gene editing, uh, gets you away potentially from some of these problematic vectors um, and can be more precise and more effective. Uh, but on the other hand, it may also pose an unintended risk of affecting the germline. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, so it's not yet completely clear which systems are going to be best for which diseases. This is also part of the current stage of research in this area.
Some of the lessons that have been learned so far, and I think this is the last of the slides that Tippy gave me, so after that you can pretend I'm giving the talk and not her. Um, uh, some of the lessons that have been learned um, are that we can, in fact, um, have therapeutic interventions that deal with this immune problem, especially when you can see in some of the mouse models how there's no memory response to the, to the protein. And uh, you also get widespread distribution, uh, which handles that problem of inaccessibility of tissue. Uh, and at the same time, there are risks with AAV of integration, and this has been done in the mice and the monkey models, uh, that can have its own side effects here having to do with clotting factors. Uh, fortunately, so far in the preclinical work, they are not reporting any issues with regard to uh, cancer-causing hot spots, so we're not worried so much about that yet, um, but it's still early days. There was a question about whether or not the maternal exposure to the viral vector that's used would pose a risk to the mother. Um, at the workshop that we had two and a half years ago, I guess, well, it might be pre-pandemic, time is shifting. Um, there had been a lot of uh, data on whether or not there was maternal risk, and it turned out to be non-existent for what they could say, see at the moment, which was very reassuring. But again, there's always a question of how much research you need to do in order to be confident of that kind of conclusion. Uh, and then again, that risk of edit, editing on the germline. And, and I want to take a moment and step back and talk about that. Because um, this kind of intervention is one that takes place in the second trimester. Uh, it takes place at a point in time late enough in pregnancy in which you have diagnosed the condition, you have figured out whether it's one of the conditions that is amenable to some kind of intervention, you have developed the intervention, you have manufactured what you need to manufacture for the therapeutic intervention, you have your, you have your team assembled. So a lot of time has gone by. So you're, um, you're pretty far into the second trimester at this point, and yet there, and so a lot of, of the, uh, you know, kind of gamete development is taking place already. But there's still the question of whether or not there's a residual risk. Um, and one thing that uh, is now being studied in non-human models is exactly what level of risk we're talking about. How likely is it that you will actually affect uh, the, actual, the actual gametes themselves? And then trying to figure out then how, what percentage of those uh, gametes will actually incorporate the gene edit, because it is not necessarily all of them. So it'll be some small number, if any. And what is that small number? And then, assuming you get a live birth, so that's another kind of discount factor, and then assuming that that live birth results in somebody who lives to reproductive age and chooses to reproduce, what are the chances that one of the altered gametes, as opposed to the other non-altered gametes that are in that person's uh, ovaries, for example, will in fact be the one that gets fertilized or is fertilizing? So, there, there, there's a lot of probabilities kind of assembled in a row that are very reassuring in sense that they reduce the possibility that a germline edit would occur and would be manifest in the next generation and that it would be an edit that is problematic because again many edits will turn out to be benign and non-functional um, or if they're not benign may cause infertility so that's another possible outcome. So, Germline edits are a risk and that needs to be explored in order to actually put numbers to these probabilities and really know what level of risk we're talking about. But it is not the kind of binary, oh my God, we're going to alter the germline risk that it can sometimes seem at first. Uh, so right now there's a lot of really careful work going on to try and assemble the research needed to put numbers on these things. But it is something to keep an eye on, and it will certainly be something that uh, the FDA will be considering as they look at whether or not these trials can go forward uh, or be approved. And I'm happy to come back if people want afterwards to talk more about the debates around germline editing, uh, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, um, uh, if it should be legal or not. So, Against this backdrop, there's a whole variety of questions. Some of them are general to all maternal fetal medicine and to fetal interventions, and some of them are particular to this particular potential therapeutic therapy. That includes how we deal with the phenomenon of having a fetal patient as well as the maternal patient, um, how, we re how we measure risk and benefit, which includes many subjective factors and many unknowns. Um, and from my position, from my uh, point of view, 
some very interesting questions about how the availability of abortion has affected how people can and should think through whether to use these therapies in however many years uh, we are facing before the abortion situation has clarified uh, state by state and federally. So in terms of the patient, this is actually very familiar. There's very little here that's new. Um, obviously, we're dealing with a situation where the uh, kind of main subject of the intervention is somebody who cannot make a choice for himself or herself. That is not unfamiliar. We deal with that all the time. Parents making decisions for children, people making decisions on behalf of those who've become incompetent temporarily or permanently. Um, but on the other hand, there does tend to be I think instinctively, even though it's not formally written into many of the regulations, um, a sense that when it comes to people who can't consent for themselves, that there ought to be a higher degree of caution when it comes to the imposition of risk. Um, it's true that technically, legally in the United States, when it comes to children enrolled in research, uh, basically parents have the same level of discretion as they would for standard therapy clinical choices. But if we look, for example, at the situation for people who are incompetent, we don't have special rules, but we have a lot of concern about the fact that we don't have special rules because we want some limitation on some of the discretion. Um, and so here, I think, uh, once again, we're going to probably find, especially at the level of the regulators, um, a kind of instinct to be particularly protective of the child's interests. Now, it's probably the case, I am told, here's where my medical information is secondary, secondhand, that these interventions are very unlikely to actually make the outcome worse than it would have been if the child had been left untreated in utero and had been born with the disease. Um, but that would certainly be one of the questions that's being asked. Are you risking making things even worse after birth for this, for this child? In theory, of course, uh, we have a history in the United States of the occasional case in which children who've been born with problems have been able to sue, whether it's the physicians that were counseling the parents or performing procedures or even suing the parents for having failed to not avoid having them be born at all. Um, most of those cases have gone away, especially the ones against the parents claiming I shouldn't have been born. It, it became too much of a metaphysical puzzle for the courts to say it would have been better for you never to be alive. Um, um, but physician, the suits against physicians obviously are always a concern uh, and a particular concern when it comes to things in the reproductive area because if there is liability, then the damages are damages that must account for a life of an extended period of time. It's not one year worth of medical expenses. It might be 80 years of medical expenses and other kinds of pain and suffering. So there's certainly going to be some caution about the potential liability in this area. Um, from the point of view of the pregnant woman, um, I think here, really, again, nothing has changed except the atmospherics. Um, we have seen an uptick uh, in the number of cases around the United States in which women are being incarcerated, uh, either subject to civil commitment or, in some cases, being prosecuted under criminal law for various actions that are perceived as having put their fetus and their future child at risk. And this is something that tends to come up every time the politics around abortion becomes more vociferous. Uh, and it becomes part of a larger discussion about the obligation of women to accept pregnancy and to accept the limitations that pregnancy uh, can, um, can cause in the way in which they operate in their own lives. So um, one concern is that we're doing this kind of in utero therapy against a backdrop that in some parts of the country in particular is one that puts women at risk of civil authorities and criminal authorities asking why are you doing that and um, who let you do that and what caused this. Uh, so while none of those are particularly directly on point to the research, I think it's just important to kind of keep these things in mind. Um, it, it's going to come up later when I mention something about where this research might be best done. Um, for genome editing, special concerns that go beyond these more general concerns. Um, one is the long-term follow-up for any child who has been the subject of gene editing. And it's not just if you do in utero editing, it's all somatic editing. The FDA has a guidance that requires 15 years of follow-up for gene therapies uh, because of the possibility of latent adverse events and also looking for decline in effectiveness of the therapy. 
And so long-term follow-up poses a logistical and financial challenge. Financially, somebody's got to foot the bill for continuing to track people, bringing them in, and examining them. Logistically, if you think about it, there's going to be principal investigators who are clinician scientists who are going to retire from practice. And who do they hand this patient off to? There are going to be biotech companies that go out of business or are swallowed up by another company. And there has to be a plan in place at the beginning for how to manage long-term follow-up, who's going to handle the handoff, and who's going to provide financing now that will guarantee the funds needed in the future to do that follow-up. Otherwise, people are going to be lost to follow-up, especially when you're talking about these extended periods of time. And we don't have that many trials in the U.S. that have ever been subject to this kind of lengthy follow-up. Usually it's a year, two years. Uh, we're looking for acute adverse events. We're not really looking long-term. And for the long-term stuff, we rely on the office at the FDA that collects data uh, that comes in. A lot of it is not statistically sound because it's not you know, properly randomized and complete in order to detect trends. So like the Vioxx experiment from a number of years ago where they were detecting an uptick in certain cardiac complications. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. So it's not as if you can just have the government authorities kind of scanning for signs that there's a problem. Uh, so that is, I think, going to be a major challenge for all the areas of gene therapy that we're beginning to uh, move into. Um, and for children, an added complication is that this follow-up takes place while they are, no, they are not yet 18 years old. So they've yet to be able to say yes or no to this. It's all the parents making the decision for them. Um, but um, when you follow a child for 15 years, you're following a child all the way up to the point where ascent and descent becomes relevant. And so at a certain point, but not yet determined, we might want to have some kind of understood norm about when children are being approached. Are you willing to continue to be dragged in to be examined every year or every two years and questioned about your health and about your environmental influences, et cetera? Um, I don't know that we're completely prepared yet for how to manage that. Um, there's also the need for systematic monitoring for the kind of problems that gene therapy and gene editing in particular may pose. And so looking for off-target effects um, on uh, any kind of organ and tissue, uh, whether it's the off-target effect on the tissue of interest or on other tissues, is still uh, something that people are working on. How to identify them, how to measure them, and then how to evaluate their significance. This is all still a moving target at the level of regulatory review within the medical reviewers at the FDA. They're getting better at it, and we're seeing this now in some of the discussions. But if you followed the discussion around sickle cell treatment for um, uh, the advisory committee that met a couple of weeks ago at the FDA, a lot of the conversation was about some of their uncertainties concerning the ability to accurately and absolutely understand the scale and significance of off-target effects in that particular uh, treatment. Um, so these are going to be issues that are going to be important to in utero editing as well as to uh, editing generally. Um, as, a regulatory, as a regulatory phenomenon, in utero editing poses some interesting conundrums. Um, in general, um, the FDA follows NIH rules, even though they are not technically required, uh, when it comes to research with pregnant women and fetuses. Now, if the research is directed at the pregnant woman, and by the way, I, I do make a note that um, when I talk about pregnant women, I'm also talking about any non-cis female who's capable of getting pregnant. Um, if the research is about the pregnant woman's own health, these rules still give her a great deal of autonomy and she can enroll herself in a trial for her own benefit. Maybe she's got a diabetic, she's diabetic, she's asthmatic, she's got cancer, whatever. There's certainly concern about making sure that the um, uh, research is not going to pose an undue risk to the fetus, and she'll be counseled about that, but she can make that decision for herself. Um, but when it comes to research that's aimed at the fetus, the rules can somewhat change. So the first issue is how much risk can be imposed on the fetus? If there is no prospect of a benefit to the fetus. If this is the kind of classic phase one research that doesn't pose a benefit, then nothing more than minimal risk can be imposed on that fetus. And it's hard to say that any of these in utero interventions would meet the standard for minimal risk. Um, so in a sense, you've got to say that this research offers the prospect of a direct benefit to the fetus. That's a hard thing to do when you're at phase one. It's a hard thing to do when you're at the first in human 
experiment following animal studies to be able to argue credibly that there is a prospect of direct benefit. Um, and yet, if you can't do that, it's almost impossible to get the phase one trial improved. So the, the rules have been written in a way that would almost kind of walk you into an impossible situation unless one has a very liberal interpretation of the prospect of direct benefit based entirely on the preclinical data with animal models. Um, that said, um, that apparently did happen at least with the enzyme replacement therapy that I mentioned earlier because they did get the approval from the FDA for the phase one trial. Um, I talked to somebody at FDA about how in the world they got to the point of saying that they could approve it, and I wasn't completely sure I understood the answer. Um, but from what I can tell, prospect of direct benefit is not an absolute, it's a relative concept. So the more that the postnatal therapies are not proving to be at all useful, the more that even the faintest hope of some effectiveness at the in utero stage allows you to conclude there is a prospect, that's the word, of a direct benefit. That's as best as I can understand how they got to that conclusion. Um, but it may be something that is worth keeping an eye on when it comes to the next set of medical reviewers. Um, and one thing that frustrates me personally, and here are my biases in terms of abortion politics and abortion rights comes to the, to the fore, so I need to highlight that for you, but it frustrates me that the rules are written so that the same level of risk imposition is allowed for fetuses that are developing toward birth and fetuses that are about to be aborted. Because it does seem that for women that are having an abortion, have chosen an abortion already, that they might be in a position to allow some of this research to go forward and let us actually learn something that would be incredibly useful for the next person whose pregnancy is supposed to go to term and result in a live born child. But the risks are the risks that are permitted are exactly the same in both circumstances. It doesn't matter that in one case the fetus is never going to actually develop to birth and experience any problems or any injuries as a result of the intervention itself. Uh, and that is, uh, that was a political choice that was made decades ago. The next issue beyond what level of risk is allowed is the issue of who gives consent. Again, if, um, you know, if, if we're talking about a direct benefit solely to the fetus, it's not about the woman giving consent for research to help herself, where she is still allowed to be the sole consenter. There's that much autonomy still, resist, still exists. But if the benefit is actually aimed at the fetus, then it's not just the pregnant woman herself who has to give consent, it's also the father who has to give consent. The logic here, I presume, is that once the child is born, in whatever condition, both parents are going to be the ones who are managing a situation with a child. Now, of course, it would help us to understand what they mean by the father, because that logic would suggest it's whoever is planning to co-parent who is really going to be taking responsibility for this child. But the regulations don't say that. They say father. And they also don't define father. So uh, an anonymous sperm donor is the genetic father. Uh, the married uh, husband of a pregnant woman is the legal father. Uh, in most states, which presume fatherhood based on marital status at the time of the pregnancy. Um, but um, we just don't have regulations that have clarified this. And we don't have enough situations here where this has become a problem that it has you know, come to political attention to the point of clarifying. Um, but it is something where I predict at some point this is going to become an issue, right? Uh, and it's just such a, it's, it's a simple thing that has to be fixed. All you have to say is that the, co the, the predicted or the intended co-parent is the one who has to co-consent. Um, but it, immediately, I think you can imagine, the politics around this would stop us from having anything as simple and sensible as that. When it comes to information for consent, I'm keeping an eye on time now. Um, uh, no surprise, really. It's simply that you need to do something very thorough in terms of explaining to people, uh, first of all, how incredibly experimental this still is um, and how little experience we have in order to know that it really is likely to offer any kind of benefit at all to the offspring. That's a very hard discussion, but it's not one that's limited to uh, pregnancy situations, it's just that I think pregnancy and parent-child relationships generally tend to have a heightened emotional content when it comes to these research questions, and so the need to really discuss alternative interventions ranging from postnatal therapy to postnatal palliative care um, have to be discussed slowly and carefully so people really understand. 
Um, also, to really help people understand some of the risks that the intervention poses for losing the pregnancy entirely, since these are, this, th these are not people that got pregnant deliberately in order to do this. They're not people that even necessarily got pregnant knowing that they were at high risk. Some people did. Others, these diagnoses are a complete surprise out of the blue. Um, and so we're talking about pregnancies that people had wanted and intended to continue. They need to understand risks of miscarriage and stillbirth. And because amniocentesis can be involved as well, you're talking about you know, risks of miscarriage that people need to really appreciate. Complicating things a little bit, depending again on where you are, has to do with local standards for the management of severely impaired neonates. Um, I know from my experiences in Wisconsin that there were often very complicated, sometimes fraught uh, discussions between the OBGYNs and the neonatologists about the appropriate care to be given immediately after birth where the neonatologists often wanted to provide support so that they could have a longer period of time to evaluate the neonate. And the OBGYNs were saying, we'd had long conversations with our pregnant woman about what she wants and doesn't want done. And if you provide support, it requires us later to withdraw support, which may be philosophically the same thing as never starting, but emotionally withdrawing is very different from withholding. And so knowing the local standards, knowing what the hospital's own policy is, which varies a lot, and particularly in religiously affiliated hospitals versus non-religiously affiliated hospitals, it is essential that there be real clarity about exactly what can and can or will or will not be done at birth, given that we're talking about newborns often with very severe conditions. Um, and then finally, whether abortion is available as an alternative. I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. But whether abortion is available in lieu of the intervention. So here's in the consent discussion, do you say, here are your choices. We can try this experimental therapy. We can let the pregnancy go forward with the possibility of an impaired or probability of an impaired child. Or you can terminate the pregnancy. Well, that may or may not be a realistic option, and particularly since we're talking second trimester. Because even in uh, you know, many, many states have now passed 15-week um, limitations on access to abortion without having an exception for later-term pregnancies that show severe impairment. And as a result, for these women uh, in those states, uh, termination is simply not available to them. They'd have to travel to get it uh, if they wanted that as an alternative. Um, so I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, but first, I want to just mention that um, the risk-benefit analysis here also becomes very difficult in these discussions. Um, we know that there is an active debate about exactly how to characterize the quality of life with various kinds of conditions. And uh, kind of a drumbeat of complaint from people, uh, in the, particularly in the disability community, that particularly those of us who aren't actively experiencing that particular disability tend to overestimate how much it detracts from the quality of our lives and how much this is very much a subjective judgment, so you've got to ask from whose point of view are we uh, evaluating the quality of life. Uh, so this question about risk and benefit uh, becomes very difficult, and it can be very helpful if there is an ability to connect people to parents of other children who've had these disorders. If the children can't speak for themselves, at least parents who know something about the condition can. Um, a very tricky business is the kind of social, the social phenomenon of some families being in a much better position to care for children. They have the wherewithal to hire help. They live in a place, you know, that where they can, where they can buy a place or move to a place that doesn't have stairs or whatever they need, uh, versus families that can't. Um, but whether or not this kind of external factor should be part of the conversation about risk and benefit uh, is itself a debatable question, um, because from the point of view of the child, right. It's the condition. From the point of view of the parents and the managing of the family, it's all of these factors to put together. And it does introduce equity issues about which people might be offered options and which people might not. Again, not limited to in utero, but I think um, heightened here. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to move on to the, the abortion question. And I'm delighted to say personally, my bias, that this slide is now out of date because Ohio uh, recently had an election and it's not reflected uh, as of the time that I, I made the slide, which was November 7. Um, but what you can see is that the darker red represents the most restrictive rules on abortion. And um, I see somebody taking a picture. You can get this from the Guttmacher Institute. And they update it on a weekly basis, so it'll be a better slide than mine. Um, 
in states that are dark red or orange, uh, it would be very difficult to do this kind of research uh, against a backdrop in which the termination of the pregnancy is an option. Whether it's termination as an alternative to enrolling or termination because something goes wrong in the effort to do the therapy and you want abortion as a backup to terminate the pregnancy rather than continuing it uh, after something went wrong. Uh, and so it raises a question about, first of all, for women who uh, don't live in a place with an abortion option, whether it becomes a bit of, a, of an undue pressure to enroll in these things because they don't have the option of terminating, so they're going to seek out whatever they possibly can. Uh, does this change the degree to which we view this as voluntary when it comes to enrolling? Um, should that mean that both because you want to ensure voluntariness and you want to retain abortion as an option in case of a problem, that the research should be done instead only in states that are some level of blue or teal, right? Which would mean, again, the Northeast and the West Coast. Now, it may be that functionally that's where it's going to happen anyway because most of the most advanced in utero fetal therapy medical centers are located in those areas, but there are some exceptions in the middle of the country where there are places that would have the capacity to do this, but where the political environment in places like Texas or my former home state of Wisconsin um, might make it a little dicey to pursue the research there. And I find it personally really unfortunate that the politics around abortion might have the unintended effect, how ironic, of interfering with an advance in trying to promote the health of, feed, of pregnancies that might result in healthy children. Um, with all of this in mind, um, there have been a series of meetings that have been looking to try to come up with what I'll call a kind of draft consensus about whether and when to try this area of gene, ther of gene therapy. Um, so one meeting, which took place a couple of years ago, uh, led to this publication from 2022 uh, on a kind of preconditions for pursuing this. The most important being that it had to be something that offered the prospect of a benefit that was greater than that of the benefits from existing postnatal therapies. Uh, otherwise, why walk into this very chancy area with all the complications? Um, the second were medical concerns about being really confident that you understood the target that you were going to edit or replace and its clinical effect once you did that um, and that you had the technical expertise on your team for all of the fetal injections. So this was one, lay, uh, one effort to lay these out and we've now got a follow-up workshop um, that took place in April uh, at uh, UCSF and uh, a group of us are now trying to write a follow-up that continues to kind of precise uh, this um, uh, set of concerns. The International Society for Stem Cell Research uh, reissued guidelines, uh, and we uh, wrote those in 2020, 2021, um, before that paper had come out in 2022, but had anticipated some of the key ele uh, elements. Now this is global instead of just national, basically about the prospect of benefit being greater than the prospect from postnatal therapies. Um, also, we had added the institutional capacity for, for autopsy so that we can actually learn something from this. Uh, and finally, the follow-up concerns, which are not insignificant. On non-directive counseling, and I'm on the second to last slide now, um, again, just talking basically the same way we were talking about informed consent, really needing to emphasize to people what the various outcome scenarios look like. Um, I have a colleague back at Wisconsin named Gretchen Schwartzy who's been working in the surgical area on trying to create a better way for surgeons to discuss not just how much can be fixed in terms of the tissue or organ, but how much, what, what's your life? Is your life going to be fixed as opposed to your tissue or organ being fixed? And has been focusing on a way to help people develop scenarios that show the range of potential outcomes in a more holistic fashion. It's exactly what you need for something like this, especially when you're talking about families that may be rearing a child with a wide variety of special conditions that need special attention. And last, but absolutely not least, even at this early stage of development, it's really important to be trying to think down the line about equitable access. Uh, in the area of sickle cell, for example, um, we have known for years that the current research, which focuses on an ex vivo methodology that takes cells from the patient's body 
edits them and then returns them is one that's going to be logistically, medically, and financially unrealistic for parts of the world where sickle cell is endemic, which is West Africa. And so for many years now, uh, to their credit, the Gates Foundation has shown interest in promoting research on in vivo alternatives that might in the future be um, manageable without any undue off-target effects and that might be more realistically available in under-resourced areas. Well, it's that kind of thinking from the very early stages that I think is important in every new emerging therapy area, including this one, because it covers what, is the, what kinds of conditions are we choosing to study. Certainly, it starts with the medical phenomenon of conditions you understand and where you have an idea about how to fix them, but paying some attention to which populations are most subject to these and making sure that uh, populations that are particularly underserved or populations that are particularly disadvantaged when it comes to the postnatal options are considered as candidates for research in terms of whether in utero therapy would work, uh, as well as our kind of now familiar concern about the diversity of the trial participants. Um, geographic diversity. I mean, this is where the abortion politics becomes a complication because you would ideally not like to limit it to people who only live in one area of the country. Um, because you don't know what other kinds of variables you haven't taken into account when you limit yourself that way. But realistically, uh, both the abortion politics and then just the sheer availability of advanced medical centers capable of doing fetal therapy means that's going to be a challenge. The biggest ones, though, I think are really uh, the economics. Uh, the economics here are a convergence of two things that are making things very expensive. Rare diseases very hard to get a uh, large enough subject population in order to meet the current standards for statistical significance that are required by regulators. And there is a drumbeat of, F, uh, of, of, claim, of, of, um, of concern about the way the regulatory system has failed to adapt to new trial methodologies and new standards of evidence that will be sufficient for, for extremely rare diseases. Now, to their credit, I can, I can hear people at FDA talking about this. In fact, Rob Califf, I think, is giving a talk just next week about a fireside chat. I just saw something cross my email this morning about FDA review of rare diseases. Um, but we are still far away from uh, solving it. And part of that is not just study population size, it's manufacturing standards. You don't want stuff manufactured in a bathtub, which is kind of what happened with one of the Duchenne's, um, yeah, one of the Duchenne's efforts. Um, but you do have to recognize that you don't have the capacity to you know, produce a manufacturing facility with the level of investment that represents a blockbuster drug that's going to be sold to 10 million people the first week it's out. Um, so what is the right balance here in terms of quality assurance, but at the same time making it realistically available? Um, the second is that all cell and gene therapies are coming out with extremely high price points. They're coming out with high price points because the development process is expensive, because transportation and manufacturing is more complicated for cell and gene therapies than it is for standard, you know, you know the, the drug you might have taken this morning, the aspirin that you took. Um, and also because in terms of value-based pricing, one and done, if they can be one and done, is worth a tremendous amount of money because over the lifetime of a patient, they save a gazillion dollars. But the upfront costs are out of reach not only for individuals, but even for entire healthcare systems. When Bluebird went to Europe with a gene therapy, even national systems that could amortize the cost over time and recognize for their subject, for their, their citizenry, for their population, over 50 years they would make their money back, but they didn't have the money now. It was going to eat up their entire national health budget. So this is, I think, going to be one of the very biggest challenges in terms of the development of cell and gene therapies generally, the in utero therapies among them, and is a challenge that I am not qualified to uh, address because I'm not an economist, um, but is one that desperately needs to be addressed because the healthcare system doesn't yet have a plan. With that, I'd like to stop and thank you very much for your attention um, for this, I think, really interesting and exciting potential area of exploration for helping children to be born healthy uh, and to live long and happy lives. Hi, Jennifer Kett. I'm the Division Head for Bioethics and Palliative Care. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. I'm just struck by also the uh, additional tension of assisted reproductive technology not being covered generally by folks' insurance and being financially out of reach for most people. That first family that you spoke about who had two children already who were uh, had died from Pompe disease might have been such a perfect candidate for some sort of assisted reproductive technology with prenatal pre-implantation mm -hmm. 
genetic screening and the fact that we often can't even offer that as an option because it's just the financial logistics are impossible is a shame. And then we end up having a much more expensive, much more, maybe not more complex, but additionally complex situation of fetal therapy. So just wanted to highlight that as well. I think it's an important point that you're making and reminding us about the lack of coverage for infertility services of various types has also been a flashpoint in debates around reproductive autonomy because it has often felt like to the extent that we're willing to fund things, we're not willing to fund people who are trying to have children, we're only willing to argue about people who are trying to avoid having children, like funding for access to contraception. And true reproductive autonomy is allowing people to truly have whatever they need to make these decisions. Complicating it, as you know, is going to be the response, the response, which is that these are personal choices. Why should society be, fun, you know, be subsidizing your personal choices? And in the area of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, um, you have this interesting, I always find this uh, interesting phenomenon. Uh, I call it the Woody Allen problem. Um, for those of you that remember, uh, in one of his movies, I think it was When Harry Met Sally, he's got the, the, the couples being interviewed in, in between scenes. And one of them is a couple of, a couple of women who are in their 60s or 70s, um, and they must have come from where I grew up in Brooklyn because they sounded just like everybody I knew. And they're complaining, which is also true for everybody I knew. <laughs> and they're saying, they're, they're complaining about this place they went, the hotel, they said the food was so bad and the portions were so small, <laughs> right? And the same complaint about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It's eugenic, it's so terrible because it's eugenics and we're encouraging people to discard embryos because the children will be unacceptable and not everybody can get it, <laughs> right? So we have this kind of weird disconnect in the debates around these technologies. Um, personally, I agree with you that it should be more easily available as an option. Also gamete donation and adoption, all these things so that people have a full range of choices. Some families, however, will not opt for those things for religious reasons or simply personal preference. Um, and we saw in a different context with mitochondrial replacement techniques, which are currently now being done in the UK but not yet in the US because again, the same limitation that prevents germline editing prevents MRT in the US. But, but when we worked, I was on a committee at the National Academies working on that topic, um, we discovered that families would know that they had the option of using gamete donation to avoid the potential transmission of mitochondrial disorders. And yet, because those disorders are so unpredictable in their presentation, they would often just roll the dice. So telling people you should use gamete donation didn't necessarily mean that you were not going to have children born with mitochondrial disorder. So yes, make it available, but no, that's not going to turn out to be the answer for everything. Sorry, that was a very long response to your point. We have one more question. Thank, thank you for this presentation. It was wonderful and, and so thought-provoking. And uh, one very brief plug, uh, thank you also for mentioning uh, Dr. Schwarzy's excellent work. Uh, and for those who are, are interested or who have uh, really uh, kind of marked these talks on your calendar like I do, um, I'll, I'll note that Dr. Schwarzy gave grand rounds on this topic at our place about six years ago. Her talk is available uh, through the uh, archives on the Truman Katz Center website. Um, but the, the, the question that I have is, is perhaps somewhat tangential, but um, I appreciate it in, in, um, in your discussion when you talked about the interest of the child, kind of highlighting um, that our focus uh, when thinking about the interest of the child centers or ought to perhaps center from the child's perspective mm -hmm. and that made me reflect on on the work from another one of our colleagues at wisconsin john robertson <laughs> um, who wrote uh, you know in the setting particularly in disability of the need to consider or try and attempt to understand from the child's perspective interests and i, I my question for you is as we think about <coughs> these emerging fetal therapies uh, or in utero therapies for a pregnant person who has come to at least learn about that in the office and are meeting with a specialist or often even a pediatric specialist, one of us, does the, the, the perspective of interest from the fetus, do we, can we continue that down? Should we be thinking about interest somewhat differently if, if we're thinking about the fetus as a patient? Uh, yeah. Um, this, this question about 
the interest of a fetus comes up in a lot of different contexts, as, as I think you, you know. Um, so looked at from one point of view, a fetus can't have interest because it's not self-aware. Without self-awareness, one can't have preferences, and without having preferences, you can't have an interest in your preferences being considered. Right? So by one set of arguments, a fetus can't have interests. Um, that's looking at it from the point of view of the fetus at that moment in time. So it's almost like, you're, you, if you think of it almost as like a, like a chronology uh, you know, of, of a timeline, and you look only at this slice and you say the fetal interests don't exist at this point because the fetus can't care. I mean, it just doesn't care. Fetus can't care if it continues to exist or not. And that is part of what is crucial to the argument in favor of abortion rights that a fetus at that point doesn't care if it exists or not because it doesn't know that it exists or could exist, and so it's okay to preference the interests of the pregnant woman. Other people look at it from a more kind of omniscient point of view, from one that looks across the future as well as the past and says the interests are the full range of potential outcomes, and so we should be looking at those and considering those fetal interests. And that is the argument by which people who oppose abortion will say that it's in the interest of the fetus to develop to term and not to be terminated. And indeed, um, in a case back in 1992 uh, called Davis versus Davis, a couple that was divorcing was fighting over what to do, who had control over frozen embryos left over after IVF. And the initial trial court decision said that it was in the interest of the embryos similar to fetus, interests of the embryos to be brought to term and so found in favor of the divorcing spouse who wanted to bring the embryos to term. Later courts disagreed and another one said no, uh, the, the, the embryo is, you know, property, uh, it's not a person and so it can't have interest, property doesn't have interest. Um, but yet another court said you can't treat embryos like toaster ovens, um, <laughs> but didn't know, what to, didn't know what to treat them as. Um, so what you've touched on is, I think, at the core of a social debate and a legal debate right now. Um, and I confess, I tend to be somebody who respects but ignores philosophy when <laughs> it doesn't get me where I need to go. Um, I'm very pragmatic. Uh, so I look at whether or not, at the end of the day, you have a good outcome or a bad outcome. So we have to debate what's a good outcome. But I ask, are you going to wind up with a healthy kid, or are you going to wind up with a kid who's miserable? You can have a kid that's not healthy, but it's also happy. That's a third possible outcome, right? But that, for me, I, you know, and I know that philosophically that is not satisfying, um, but I, I have a feeling I'm not alone <laughs> in this approach to these things. Uh, so I don't think of it as much as fetal interest as I think of it in terms of what would make the resulting child feel like it was good to be here among us. With that, I want to say thank you to everybody who attended, and particularly thank you, Professor Charo, for your talk. Thanks very much for your attention.